If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump. Of Mind Pump. For the first 51 minutes, we do our introductory conversation. Make sure you tell people Justin will be here. He's the in the episode. Right. This he is, just had to leave this is dog, before we did the intro. His dog swallowed a tennis ball. A ball. Yes. A ball. So he had to leave now. I don't know. What's up with the dogs in the emergency? Right I don't now? know, like, man. man got a rough, rough run for the puppies. Maniacs. So he's out uh, there. We start off by talking about Adam's tummy. What? That's, we say, Sal's tummy, my stomach. And Organifi probiotics. Uh, Adam actually has been using the probiotics to help heal his little belly because he got sick there for a second. Orally. If you go to OrganifiShop.com, enter the code Mind Pump, you'll get an exclusive Mind Pump discount. We talk about Japan's reprogrammed stem cell heart repair. This is crazy. Insane. You can actually heal your heart with uh, Japan's new uh, technique, I guess. Some Marvel shit going on. We talk about the time I choked out my sister's boyfriend and other macho moves. Did he deserve it? <laughs> no. We talk about arm wrestling in Sicily. That was fun. <laughs> the power of being offended. Oh, boy. That's Sal's right. memes starting to rub people the wrong way. That's right. And then we talk about the documentary Take Your Pills uh, and Kids and Drugs. We're talking about the legal drugs, you know, the ones that your government approved that are still terrible for you. Then we get into the questions. The first question was, how do each of us structure our training during periods of heavy travel? So when we travel a lot... How do we like to work out? We actually mentioned- Find out if Justin just eats pizza and doesn't work out. <laughs> we talk about Maps Anywhere in that particular part of the episode. Uh, oh, and by the way, Maps Anywhere, 50% off this month more. I'll talk more about that in just a second. The next question was, are there some things to try when you feel like your body isn't even progressing anymore, even though you've been doing the same stuff that always seems to work? What do you do? It used to work. Now it's not working. Do the same stuff. How do I get my body to move forward? The next question was, uh, how should you reintroduce calories and food after prolonged restriction? Uh, so in other words, if you've been dieting for a long time, you got your goal body weight, you're lean, now you want to start eating more again, do you just eat a lot all at once, like a lot of competitors do, or should you do it slowly in a reverse dieting type of way? We talk about some new science in that portion of this episode. And finally... What are some tips that we can give to help trainers retain clients? You know, getting clients is one thing. Keeping them is another. Uh, if you're really good, you do both really, really well. Uh, also, this month, as you heard me say earlier in this intro, Maps Anywhere, half off. I'm excited about this one. This is, I think we talked about this multiple times on the show over the last year or two, that it's probably the most underrated program that we have, and we got a lot of stuff going on. We got a new program that's coming out. We got all kinds of stuff that we just came off of a great super bundle special. It's been a while since we've even addressed or talked about anywhere. I think this is a cool thing for people, even if you're not somebody who is working out of hotel rooms or working out at home all the time. It's a great one to have in your guys' arsenal for sure. Absolutely. The workouts themselves require minimal equipment like a band and a stick or your body weight. It's extremely effective programming. Of course, it can be done anywhere. And for the entire month of June, it's half off, 50% off. You can get this program or check out our other MAPS programs at mindpumpmedia.com. So Doug hears us at a higher level than we hear ourselves. And so how we're always like, hey, Doug, could you turn up a little that's bit? All, that's uh, just what's in your headphones. My, my ears are like blasting all yeah, the time. Yeah, so it doesn't, it's not changing how loud he hears it. It's only uh, cha changing how yeah, loud yeah. I hear it. Okay. So you is, can go louder or softer depending on what you want. And it's good for guests. Uh, have you noticed some of our guests yes, go like yeah, this? They, get like, yeah. they don't like it? Yeah, yeah. some of our oh, guests don't like it. Oh, perfect for the guests because now they have the control. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So like, even right now, it's a little How much are those, Doug? 25 bucks. God, you know you gotta love technology. I know. Right? You gotta love. You know how much that would have cost in 1975? So disruptive. Ten million dollars <laughs> <laughs> at least. That 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 was the same technology that took the fucking space yeah. shuttle to the moon. Yeah, yeah. twenty five bucks. It is. You know what I'm saying? I don't think the space shuttle went to the moon. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. oh, it didn't. Oh, That's right. It was just the rocket. Oh man. Oh. 
Oh. Oh. You're not recording, are you? Yes, you are. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we are. That yes, we are. Is he's going to edit that out so it sounds like I said that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the space shuttle is not what went to the moon. Save, save that part. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I got the I got the probably the weirdest. This is a good game. Let's name the weirdest feedback or the most unexpected, like wrong feedback. <laughs> Sometimes I get feedback from fans, and I'm just like, no. That's not that's not, that's not the case. Oh, would you like do? what? Like, I had, in regards to the show, what you said? Some dude sends me a DM and he's like, he's like, yeah, you guys, uh, you guys encouraged Justin to talk a lot, and now Adam barely ever talks. I'm like, what? <laughs> I did say, yeah, are right. you? When, when did that? What, happen? what universe are you from? Yeah, what did what? he say? He's like, he's like, you guys are always t- telling Justin to talk more, and I, and you know, he was really quiet at first, and now he's talking a lot more in the show. But now Adam barely ever talks. Like, oh that's God. actually totally wrong. It's actually, <laughs> not accurate. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, like, can't, you know what that probably. I can't even explain. Like, I can't even. That's hear that. Like, what are you talking? <laughs> you know I mean, he's probably a massive Adam fan. That's, a, that's like a, can't get enough. Who yeah. is it? I like the guy already. I know, right? <laughs> sounds like my, <laughs> sounds like my kind people. of people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. when he said that, I'm I was like, just not enough Adams. Well, like, there's like, cowbell. It's like, yeah. you gotta be. Just, I'm not getting enough. Adam. But for me to like listen no, to your feedback, there needs to be some truth in it. There's no truth in <laughs> there's that. There's still people that can, there's still people that confuse us. Like people that are still coming on that. Oh my God, that might be it. Yeah, no, there's still people like they don't don't follow us on IG, listen to the show, or maybe they just now started following. I've had people start following me and think that we're one of the other guys. I really? feel like we should go around right now. Like I'm Justin. <laughs> yeah, let's okay, do this roll, is Justin's voice. Roll, roll call. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. No, I, this is Sal That's speaking. Sal. Uh, yeah. 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 This is Adam. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I don't have a good impression of you <laughs> yeah, yet. I've been trying to work on it's it. It's hard to do, me. Yeah, people uh, uh, whose voices got confused you. the most. I think you and I got confused the most, Adam. When Which people is weird thought to mine me. was yours and your. Yeah, because I, I. So here's the funny. Thing. I we listened, speak so differently. We it's sound completely different. I right. listened to what you talk right. I'm like, that would sound weird coming out of my face. <laughs> 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 what would you do, Justin? If, if if you first met me and I was talking like him. Like, oh wow! Hey, I, Adam, I, I'd how, trip out. Hey, Justin. Hey, how fun? Hey. Would, hey, how fun would that be? One episode. We should try our best. You, you have to sound like me the whole episode, and I have to sound just like you. I feel like, like everybody get their feelings hurt at some point. <laughs> you know yeah, I, mean? I know. If we like, just try to like, yeah, it sound like I'll, I'll be Sal the whole episode. No, you already do it all the time. I know. That's because I don't be have Adam. Adam yet. Yeah, I have to figure that one out. Mine's easy. Uh, I'll work on that. I'll mine's, get back to mine's you. super easy, yeah. dude. How's your, your? You're smiling. How's your? How's your tummy? It's coming together this is actually the first day that i haven't been chewing on probiotics like crazy so, so you were taking the, the the probiotics yeah how many ta- times a day yeah or organifi well you know what i meant i've actually been meaning to ask you so i'm actually glad you asked me that uh it i it felt like it was the right thing for me to do i should i should have ran it by you yeah so after i kind of my protocol was you know initially like i couldn't hold anything down and so charcoal and soup was kind of like the protocol for what I was doing. And then once I started, uh, once I was able to eat like solid foods, I still, my stomach was still kind of like gurgling and this and that. So I was like, you know what, maybe I'll start using the uh, Organifi's probiotic with all my meals. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm only eating two, three times a day, right? So I'm not like over. over. Oh yeah, that's plenty. No, it's uh, that's actually good. When you have um, a, like a, a severe, and I don't mean gut issue in the sense of inf- inflammatory, irritable bowel syndrome type gut issues. Because in that case, then this advice may apply, may not apply. I'm talking about like if you have like a stomach virus, like you get the norovirus or you get food poisoning or when you're on antibiotics, then taking high doses of anti- of probiotics has been shown to be beneficial. But okay. it, it, there's an individual. Of okay, course, so I was, I'm doing the right thing here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, do you, is there, a, can I overdo it? I of mean, course. Okay. Yeah, of course. So you may have a, a, a bad reaction to taking too many. But the dose in the Organifi, if I'm not mistaken, is 25 billion. Maybe Doug, you can look that up. It's a real small number. I think it's 20. No, it's. <laughs> I think it's 25 or 50 billion. So let's double check. But I take on an almost regular basis 100 billion once oh, a day. Okay. Anyway. Oh, okay. So and, I'm nowhere near that. If no, it's 25, I'm nowhere near that. 25 is probably a good place to start for for most people, and it's got the. Uh, the bifido, uh, uh, the bifido bacterium and the um, acidophilus uh, bacterium in there, which are the ones that that they've been that have shown to have positive effects in the gut. It's funny. I was talking to Ruscio the other day about this, and there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of confusion over what the probiotics actually do in the gut. So a lot of us think, and I even thought this initially was that it's fifty billion. It's fifty billion. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
what I, I initially what I thought was that you take these beneficial bacteria and then they populate your gut. Mm-hmm. And Ruscio said no. That's what I thought. They that's, don't, not, that's not how this that's works. How no, he says they don't populate your gut. What probably happens is that as they go through the gut, they release or they have an antibiotic and natural antibiotic effect. So it neutralizes the other bacteria in the gut or, or helps prevent them from overgrowing or causing dysbiosis. Mm. And he thinks that, and he says that happens when they're alive, but it also happens when they're dead because he said there's studies that show that even if you swallow dead probiotics, people still get a benefit. Mm. It just goes to show you how little we know about, yeah. about all of this stuff. Wow. It's fucking weird. There's, it's I can tell that I feel like better like my, the way my stomach does when I have I have one. I mean, you, and you were the one that really. I was never somebody who would even take a probiotic pill before, but you know, I thought you know because my because I don't have gut issues. I don't yeah. have major gut issues, but I I definitely get upset stomach sometimes or get the flu or whatever the fuck it was that food poisoning, whatever it was that I just had. And so there's been times where I'm just like, oh, my stomach's uneasy. I know I need to eat. And then when I eat with that, it does make me feel mm. ten times better, man. Food poisoning mm. is the worst because it, it, it's the clo- it's like you feel like you're literally gonna die. Yeah, you know when you're sitting there and you're 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 throwing up and there's nothing and you yeah. just mm. uh, I, you make that sound. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's yeah. so <laughs> I, hate, I hate that I, because I've had it enough times and I know how awful it is if you have nothing to throw up. Like what I do is when I start getting uneasy, what I was doing when I was throwing up is like I would chug water so I would have something to throw up. Really? So, oh, yeah. So, like, mm. if I... so what? Because I, I couldn't hold anything down. I couldn't hold Pedialyte. I couldn't hold water. I couldn't hold anything down during the the, the window when I really started throwing yeah. up. But after you've thrown up about two or three times in a row, you got most of everything out that you had. And so what I've learned is in the past, if I didn't drink anything, which would suck, because if I drink just a little bit of water, I'd have to throw up, yeah. I would just not do anything. And then you start dry heaving, and that's just painful, oh. and that's the worst. Ugh. So now what I, I was doing was when I before I went to the restroom and I would just like right before I just pound as much water until mm. it's just ready to come right out. But at least throwing up water is better than like throwing yeah. oh, up. Oh man, I don't know toy. if I agree with that. Yeah. Is, there, <laughs> is there any way to throw up without waking up the whole house? No, yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> Dude, every time I, I can't I don't know, like I can't control that. You know, like uh, like Courtney gets up. Oh my God, what's happening? Yeah. You know, like I don't know if that happens to you guys, but it's just like the loudest, like most obnoxious. My buddy, I'm a loud. My buddy calls yeah. it uh, calling dinosaurs because <laughs> that's what it sounds yeah. like you're doing. <laughs> 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 and then you're, I get like the, the like petechiae, is that what they call it, where it's like you you almost like bruise these little like the blood vessels, blood vessels, yeah, oh, yeah. pop out. Yeah, oh, dude, I get that every single time it's like you're like you're doing a max squat like you're straining that hard. yes oh and i can't a, do it any other way dude my abs when i was in thailand and i got because that's the worst i ever had it. i've never had it like in thailand where i was literally started to get slightly hallucinatory i was literally in bed started to see things a little bit differently because i was i had a fever but when i was throwing I, I got sore my abs got sore the following like yeah the, the next day i was like wow if I have to throw up again, it's going to hurt that even was more. A workout because <laughs> yeah. my abs are in so much pain, <laughs> dude. So on that science tip, I just got an article I want to share with you guys, which is freaking rad. Let me pull it up real quick. Mm. In Japan, they've approved uh, now as part of a pilot study. They have permission to treat people who have heart disease with cells that are produced by revolutionary reprogramming techniques. So what they do is they take. They get cells from body tissues like skin and blood, and they revert them to an uh, embryonic-like state, and then which they turn from them which into goo? from which they can turn into other cell types. And what they'll do is they'll make these sheets of tissue that they develop from these uh, these stem cells, if you will, mm. and they'll put them on damaged hearts, and then the hearts seem to be healing what? faster. Wow! What? How fucking cool. So this is like a gel it kind of turns into? That they sort I of, don't know. It's pretty It's pretty awesome. And now, Sounds like some Wolverine shit to me. Yeah, yeah. It does, right? So it's like what they think is that I'm the- I'm slathering that over my whole body. So I, the cells know. don't integrate into the heart tissue. So at first, when they first did this, like, oh shit, the cells themselves are like meshing themselves in. No, what they think that's happening is that they're releasing growth factors that then re- help your body regenerate itself. Mm. But dude, think of the applications wow. of this. Yeah, you know. Oh, there it is. Doug just pulled it up. Think about how crazy that is, right? If you have like like damaged liver, damaged kidney, whatever. Yeah. If they could like create these sheets of 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 stem cells, slap them on, and then your body starts to rebuild yeah. itself. 
Dude, that'll be a whole literally reprogram. What do you think will happen? What do you think will happen if we reach a point where, if you have a problem with one of your organs, that you could just go to the doctor and they'll just, you know, do something to fix it right away? Do you think people just say fuck it and do whatever they want? Well, that's, (laughs) dude. Yeah, this is. I do believe that. I really. I believe that. Like, you know, we we see what's happening with, and we talk about this all the time with disease and the food and everything like that. I feel like it's a race right now on like do we oh do we kill ourselves or we do a do we push the limit so bad where we're about to freaking kill ourselves off that we have to start coming back the other way nutritionally or does science evolve yeah. f- fast enough to where you can good do question. to do all that bullshit. You I see st- all the advancements of that, but then I've also been paying attention to comic books. You know, and I know <laughs> I know where this goes. You've been paying attention to dude. Comic like books. you're gonna grow a tail. Yeah, and like you're gonna grow some fucked up scales. You know, there's gonna be side effects, dude. When this, so here's what onto some shit. So you know what technology does is it makes, uh, it makes things less. We were just talking about this earlier. You know, uh, I I think it's at the beginning of this podcast where we have this new device that helps us control the volume of our mics and our ears to ourselves or whatever. Stuff like that would have been so expensive like ten years ago, right? Like all the cameras and stuff we have here to produce our YouTube videos fifteen years ago would have been. You know, half a million dollars with equipment today. Dude, it's like, on our phone, it's, it's like better than what it was back yeah, then. So yeah, so all this kind of technology, at some point, it's going to be so decentralized that people will have the means, if they're smart enough, to kind of do it themselves. You know there's going to be fucking people who are going to be experimenting on themselves. Of course. They're, they're going to be like, hmm, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give myself eagle eyes. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, do some shit to their eyes where they can see all afar. And- oh, all, I mean, there's a guy that literally created like himself into a lizard. Like He, he wanted to like tattoo his whole body so he has scales and then like carve his teeth so he's got these crazy teeth in his tongue. He identifies as a lizard. It's like, you know, yeah, this whole identifying as other things, right? <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. going to go fucking crazy. Probably. <laughs> yeah. There's, there was one guy who inserted all these sensors into his body. What if all those futuristic movies got it right where they have like weird characters like Star Wars like that in there? I'm but the, di- the guys, difference is they all started like- They as started as humans, humans yeah. and now they're humanoid, you know, whatever, <laughs> uh, reptilian- There's Lizard Man right there. There he is. That gross motherfucker. So, so <laughs> sci-fi oftentimes- What if you like ask your, your daughter out on a date? I, oh my God. What would you do if what? a dude- that looks like that. Who you, self-identifies you know as a lizard? You failed as a father. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you right. failed. You failed, bro. You know what you, you do? Failed really? that, you brought if, this home. If that dude shows up to your fucking house as a dad, dude, you fucking failed. <laughs> I don't care how much good advice you've been giving on Mind Bump for the last <laughs> fucking, for the last like, three years. If your daughter shows up with a motherfucker like that on your door, you know what? Eating an ice cream cone I'm, with his fucked up. I believe it goes tongue. like this. If yeah, like, like, every father, the, like the number one goal is to keep your daughter off the pole. Right? That's the number one goal. <laughs> yeah, don't be a stripper. Number two is like, do not let the lizard man come. To pick your daughter up for fucking for the prom. Uh, yeah. like that's number so two. I've right gone, underneath the pail. I've gone through so many of these scenarios in my head, right? Like, what if my daughter shows up with some, and I, my son too? It's not just a girl thing, but you know, as being a father, you always tend to go. Really, there, do right? you really worry about your son bringing home well, something? Think weird? about this. Way. What if look, hmm. you've got two, you've got two boys, Justin. Yeah. What if your dad brings home some girl your named Dad, your son? I'm sorry, your son yeah. brings home some girl named Bubbles or something like that, <laughs> and she's like. Hey, um, yeah, and she's like and twirling her hair. Yeah, anyway, so and whatever. I'll just shake my head. And then and she, like, you know, oh man, you still be a little worried, right? Like especially if your son was super involved, <laughs> you know, mean, I'm super in love. I, I, should say. I would look at that. I'd be like, hey, son, I'll pull him aside, but you know, like I hope this is a phase, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Get through this. Quickly. So I've gone. I'll pull him aside. Is this the main girlfriend or is this just yeah. one of them? Right? <laughs> <It's>, no. <laughs> like I know. Like, you know what? I'm going to control your finances. Yeah, let's, Go do your thing, but let me control your finances. Say, son, listen, you, yeah. you brought the wrong one home tomorrow. Bro, this is the one that you uh, go hey, out with on yeah. Saturday let me, nights. Let me tell you something. I got a boy and a girl, yeah. and I guarantee you my son's going to get his heart broken harder than my daughter. Boys do. Totally. Boys get blasted early on by girls. Really, really girls early are, on. Girls are ruthless. Yeah, so... But anyway, I've gone through these scenarios in my head and I've imagined like, what if she showed up with some fucking total loser and she's like, you know, 17 and he's like 20 and he's got a motorcycle, some weird shit. <laughs> some weird shit. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, that's not that weird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I guess there's, there's a really good chance like, that could happen actually. Uh, it's like a rebel. You know? So <laughs> I, I've been thinking about this, snake right? snake tattoo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what I would do? I wouldn't react. I think the worst thing you could do would be react in a way. Or really like them. To, I just act super cool. Like, oh, yeah, okay, that's cool. Hey, what's up, bro? How you yeah, doing? Nice. Are you, you, the move is to, for you to get a bike and be like, hey, let's go out. You know? yeah. And they try and join his gang. Befriend him. And then yeah. throw, throw a pole through a spoke while he's driving. <laughs> exactly. Oh, shit, he died. Weird. <laughs> My bad. Whoa, dude. You no, just, I'm just kidding. You went dark yellow. Yeah. I went too fast. What happened to Billy? <laughs> yeah. Like, like daddy had a motorcycle. You killed him over that? <laughs> Jesus, bro. <laughs> did I tell you what? I had a snake tattoo. That was enough. That was it. That's did I tell you what I did to my, my, my sister, 
No. So my sister, when she first started dating, she invites this this dude over to do homework together. Now I was a very overprotective older brother. Like I was terrible, right? My poor sister. Like I, I God bless her. I feel so bad for her. But anyway, so this kid comes in, nice kid or whatever, and he kind of shakes my hand when he walks in, and I cr- obviously crush his hand with the handshake. That was the first thing I did. Just kind of, <laughs> Kind of show yeah, him you're mandatory. Yeah. yeah, just kind of show him like, listen, yeah, I'll, I'll, listen, I got a grip. Yeah, so he comes in, and I'm not afraid to use. Yeah, it. so then they're, they're, he's coming in, and they're hanging I've out. I've always found that it was a weird thing yeah. <laughs> when guys do that. Yeah. I get that all the, the time when you meet people group. like for the first time. They're like, yeah. Yeah. they like yeah. give you like the, everything they got. I'm like, what does that prove? Uh, nothing that you got a good ass handshake. It was my yeah. ego, dude. Yeah. I was, I was. How old was I? I was probably twenty or something like that. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I, it also annoys me the other side of the spectrum when people shake like this, the little weak hand. Yeah, it's like four. Oh, fingers. Limp oh, hand. God. Yeah, like yeah, exactly. Limp uh, hand. They give oh, you. Do God. not get me the flip. Like, actually, that's the only time I squeeze hard now. If someone gives me the weak hand, then I'm gonna like I'm gonna remind them. <laughs> I'm gonna crush your bones. You gotta have some, t- <laughs> you gotta have some tension in that hand, there, buddy. Yeah, so he comes out. in. I give him a hard handshake. Comes in. We're all having conversation, <clears throat> and a couple times he like he did something to assert himself a little bit, and I was like, all right. So then the conversation comes in, and, and you know I'm like, so what do you do for fun? Whatever. He's like, oh, I wrestle. I'm like, oh, you do? I'm like, that's cool. I'm like, you know, I did a little judo when I was a kid, you know? So I'm like, me and my dad, we like to grapple in the, in the living room because we had this big living room with carpet. <laughs> oh, my God. So I'm like, dude, show dude, me. Dude, let's some, do this. I'm like, show me some moves. Like, yeah. this is cool. Show is me like, some moves. You guys seen that movie Four Christmases? No. That's uh-uh. like, what? Uh-uh. No. Oh, put that on your list to watch. Right, right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dude, so I take him in the living room. And I knew what he was going to do because he's a wrestler. He was going to try and do a double leg on me, just a right, traditional. You shoot your legs? Yeah, so I fucking choked the kid so hard, dude, <laughs> so fast. He's like, Argh! and I choked him, and he didn't know to tap out, so he passed out a little bit. He comes to. <laughs> My sister was so upset. Of course. She was so mad. Why you, you didn't have to go so hard. I'm like, I didn't, I didn't go hard. I did. I went hard. I can't That's believe you guys so haven't great. seen Vince Vaughn's Four Christmases. No, no, no. And, and he, yeah, they, they, they go to, so the, both their parents are divorced. They go to all these Christmas and the, one of the first house they go to is like her side of the family's hella redneck. And like he walks in and the brother like is still, he's like 40 and he's still into like WWF wrestling and shit like that. <laughs> oh my God. Straight wrestles like him in the, Vince Vaughn wrestling. In the yeah, 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 fucking wrestles him in the living room. Have shit. you ever been in a situation like that where you go over a girlfriend's house or something and their dad or their brothers try to assert themselves? Oh yeah. yeah. Have you guys ever, what do you, how do you guys handle that? You know, I think, I think I just slough it off. Being, being a, being a confident guy already, I think you just, part of being confident, you're used to guys trying to challenge you like that i've yeah. i've yeah, always been a, totally i once i once i got up to you know my junior year i sprouted up over six foot and even though i was a skinny guy i wasn't a big guy tall guys used to get get that all the time when i walk would walk somewhere like i don't know what it you're is a target yeah i'm automatic like every guy is measuring himself against you it doesn't even yeah. matter if you're sure. in, into fighting not didn't matter so or you have muscles at all right uh, then you added when i you. got tall and i started to build like a physique on me like i've always been the one of those guys that when I get into a place that people are always dick measuring with me all the time. Yeah. So I yes. think I'm kind of used to that. So it doesn't really, it doesn't really phase me when I see that. In fact, now I've seen it so much that you're, you're so used to it. And when you see a guy that's like that, you know that he's really insecure and that's what's mm-hmm. causing him to do that. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, Oh, this poor dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like, feels like, like, Oh, you're worried about me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You're really, uh, like, yeah. So yeah, I, I usually just try and like lighten it up and like not let it even phase me at all. <laughs> just, I've never had a guy try to wrestle me. Oh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Oh yeah. No, I don't know how old <laughs> I, know I, was. I would do that. I might've been like, I might've been young. I might've been 17 or 18, like pretty young. And that, you know, right when you're in she's that She's younger of, than you too though. Yeah. She's about, yeah, uh, see, I'm, Oh no, no, no. I was, I was young. So I was like 16 because she was 14 and this was a 14. Yes, I was really young actually at the time. So 16-year-old Sal, <laughs> the ego was a little bit, a little yeah. different than the, than the ego well, is now, I, you know? All of ours Especially were. for my sister, right? For my sister, I'm like, oh, you're going to fucking, you try and kiss my sister? I'm going to choke uh, you out real quick. Yeah. I experienced that. I've never experienced the other end of that because remember I, I had dated my, at the time, you know, when I was married, I dated her for so long. I knew her family well, knew each other. But I experienced it when I went to Italy to visit family one year. I was, I think I was 20, and we went to visit, and my cousin, now keep in mind, part of my family is like old school backwoods in the hills Sicilian. So this is like, this is like- Not like, sure what that like means. Like banjo Sicilian. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Like, not sure what that means. So like, imagine like backwoods, rural America, 
you know, compared to like, you know, the Bay Area. That's how this, okay. that's how Sicily and parts of Sicily are. Got right? it. So you guys like milked your own like, cows, like you did Like, this. bro, it's like, I'll, I'll give you an example. So she was- Old th- world. And this is real, by the way. I'm not like making- You go next door to like borrow some yeah. milk from the neighbor and they give you a bucket to go outside. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, so- like, so sure, here you, you go. You sleep with goats. So yeah. she, my yeah. cousin was uh, 18 or had just turned 18, eloped- Okay, with a 36 year old man. Just give you an example of how Whoa. how Whoa. backwards, yeah. Interesting. So, and he, in my family in Sicily, is not well off at all, but these guys were even more like in the hills type of deal. So we go, I go to the visit, and she had just eloped with the guy, and so the, the we're like, let's go visit, you know, let's go visit this her with her new husband. So we drive up, we're driving up in the fucking hills, and we come up and we get greeted by, and I'm not making this up, dude, the grandfather, old brown burlap sack looking overalls, so like old school Sicilian looking clothes, and a rifle. He has a rifle on him, and he shows up and he shakes our hand, and they're talking old school Sicilian dialect, like the kind that my grandparents talked to when I was a kid. So I'm like, this is interesting. So we get there, and we're meeting the family, and they have like a barn, this is when I remember the told the story I told you guys where they had the goat that was tied up and I thought it was a pet, and then my uncles come in and slaughter the goat in front of me and I was like, oh shit, oh what God. the fuck's going on here? Yeah. So it was a big barn, and I start to meet the rest of their family and they're introducing me as you know and my is is my American cousin Sal. So they already think I'm like, they think America, they think Beverly Hills, Hollywood, totally different you know type of people. So I walk in and they're like, oh, you're from America. I also was kind of built at the time. I weighed about two, maybe two fifteen, so I'm kind of thicker and bigger. Yeah. Immediately, the conversations are like, "So, uh, are you as a? Uh, is that just for looks? You know?" Yeah. I'm like, "Oh, well, no. I mean, I don't know. And, you know, I work out a little bit. Oh, so you you think you're strong <laughs> then? Well, I don't. And these are all like really macho Sicilians. We also brought my go- my my grandfather with us, and my grandfather is very old school and is a shit talker. This is what he does. He just talks hella shit, especially if he thinks. <clears throat> you're trying to be a badass. Mm-hmm. So as soon as these guys are saying this to me and I'm shrugging it off and I'm laughing and they're all very like, you know, they got the, like the, what is that? When they, when they chew on the piece of hay or whatever, mm. like just imagine that, right? So my grandfather real loud, he's like, he's strong enough to kick your ass. And I'm like, oh my God. Dude. <laughs> he's fitting you. Yeah, <laughs> dude. The, I'm like, oh my God, dude. Uh, and man. so everybody's getting worked up and they're like, oh yeah? You, you, that, you, think, right? you, you think you kick that my, right? You think you can kick my ass? I'm like, no, I can't kick your ass. You guys look like tough guys. Like, I don't like to fight. My grandfather's like, he's just being modest. He could kick two of your asses at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, calm down, I'm man. I'm like, whoa, dude. Yeah. This guy's have a rifle. And it starts getting kind of heated. So then we go in the, in the barn and everybody starts drinking wine. And now my grandfather's getting loud and Uh-oh. my grandfather's talking shit. And I don't remember what their last name was. He was, I don't remember what it was, but <laughs> this weird image coming together yeah. in my head right oh, now. This, yeah. It's this exactly of this scene right here, bro. Yeah. It's, it's like the Godfather part two when they go to Sicily and they see like, you guys watch part two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just like that. Okay. okay. Where the women are kind of like careful not to, they say the wrong thing around their husbands and all that weird shit. So we're sitting around this table in the barn. We start drinking wine and the shit talking keeps going. So then my grandfather stands up, gets up on his chair, because now he's had some wine, and he goes, listen here. He goes, I don't remember what the last names were, okay? Let's just say it was, uh, you know, I don't know. Let's say it was Fettuccine or something. Fettuccine. Shit, <laughs> <laughs> so my grandfather stands oh my God, up and he goes, say that. he goes, the Fettuccines will never be as strong as the DiStefanos. Like, makes this loud proclaimment. And oh, it's like wow. challenging them. Wow. And my dad looks at me and he's like, he makes the eyes at me like, my dad's like, going. What's happening? My dad's starting shit. And, and. It, my dad it's about to go down, and yeah. in the old school Sicilian like respect for your dad, like my dad's a grown man, he ain't gonna say shit because it's his dad. So he's like, I can't say nothing. That's my dad. Yeah. He's in charge. Right? So then they all get worked up, and so then they start talking shit to me, and they're like, Well, if you're so strong, then you arm wrestle me right now on this table. So everybody gets clear, and everybody's getting all heated. And so then my grandfather, who's you now talking, now they're talking shit. Now their patriarch, who's their grandfather, is talking shit to my grandfather. My grandfather says, before you arm wrestle Sal, why don't you arm wrestle his brother who's only 14 years old? If you can beat him, then we'll let you arm wrestle Sal. They all start laughing. Now, my brother's strong as fuck. <laughs> like, <laughs> however strong I am, it's built through resistance training, right. like heavy, this is just in his DNA. meticulous, <laughs> like detail to like everything to try and be strong. Yeah. My brother naturally is fucking as strong as I am if I train really hard. Let's just put it that way. So he's just a strong kid, even when he was a kid. So now everybody's laughing because of this skinny 14-year-old. Like, yeah, we're not gonna, nobody, we'll, we'll kill him, we'll crush him. He's like, well, f- well, then give it a shot. So my brother arm wrestles 
their biggest guy says, no, I'm not going to do it because he's a kid. Have him arm wrestle my, you know, this other kid, this other guy who's like the 17 year old. So my brother fucking crushes him. So now my grandfather's talking hell of shit. <laughs> hell of shit. It up you more. can't even beat a 14 year old. Like, told, <laughs> talking hell of shit. So then their biggest dude on their family's like, all arm wrestle him. And, and so I think my grandfather saw, like, oh, he's, he's probably going to beat this little kid. He says, fine, you can arm wrestle Sal. So he sits down. His wife steps in and she goes, no, 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 don't arm wrestle him. The American's going to hurt you because they saw my brother and sees me, who's this 220, who I look like a massive guy to these guys because nobody ever works out in this area. They don't know what it looks like. So he goes, no, don't arm wrestle him. He's going to hurt you. The American's going to... He fucking pushes her like face, pushes her away. <laughs> Get out of here. Oh. Men are talking. I'm like, oh, oh shit. It's this so is getting... Old school. Old school. This is getting crazy. So then I arm wrestle him. So we we get our hands together. So then my dad tells me in, in English, he goes, Sal, he goes, he goes, pretend like you're going hard, but then I want you to embarrass him. So now my dad's getting in on it. I'm like, oh, good. Now he's oh. drunk. <laughs> so that's what I did. I was pretending like I was straining. And then I kind of laughed at him and I <laughs> smashed him. <clears throat> my grandfather gets up on the table, kicks over fucking wine bottles. Ah, oh, I told you guys. Ah. So everybody's talking shit. <laughs> it's getting super heated. Oh, and then we God. became friends. And then yeah. everybody was hella cool. We were all good after that. And then we could, dude, but, now I know why you want that arm wrestling machine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude. No this wonder. is where it all comes from. Oh, dude. oh it's so great. That's dude, a great story, If though. you guys ever... My grandfather passed away, but if you guys had ever I met I would him, love your grandfather. Oh, That's oh, like my people. You know, speaking, speaking of sex... That reminds me of my, my great uncle. Speaking uncle of Dooley. sexist men, I saw that uh, <laughs> yeah. you, you got your you got uh, a little bit of heat for your bagel fucking post. Just just, to, just one, one, or one or two people. So dumb. Dude, people you, are so sensitive. I, I think it's so crazy that we live in this this oversensitive world that you can't. It's a goddamn meme, first of all. Right. And it's a joke. It, <laughs> calm, everybody needs to calm down. <laughs> yeah. So the joke is, the, the, I'll read the meme, the meme, so people can. Understand. I think you took it down, didn't you? Uh, it, I think I, it, no, no, it's it was gone. It expired. Yeah, yeah oh, they expired. Okay. Oh, okay. I, I was like, oh, I hope Sel didn't take that down no, because of one they, person it messaging him some no, bullshit. Okay, like so that. here's the meme. It's a it's a it's a bagel, <laughs> where it's like a really plump bagel where you can't even see through the the hole in yeah, the bagel. Like the holes. And it says, "I'm closed super, up." Yeah, and it says, "I'm young. I want to find myself." And then there's a picture of a bagel with a big old hole in the middle, and it says, "I want to settle down with a nice guy now." <laughs> it's a joke. It's but I got two people who are like that's sexist. Yeah, and it's I'm not like, though. Uh, it's not sexist. Yeah, well, why why can't it be a guy looking for another guy as he gets older? That's what I said to the so other person. It, I'm it, like, it could be a dude, right? <laughs> it could be a bottom. That's right. That, that's yeah. what makes me mad is that people are triggered like that over. But it doesn't it. matter, even if it was like, it's just come on, joke. everybody. You know, here's the thing: like, we need to be able to be okay with joking with each other and teasing each other, like. You know what's funny? I have. Well, why is it okay? You mo you must post a bajillion memes. I can't even keep up with all of them. I know. And many of them are are teasing, you know, uh, liberals or different or, or conservatives or conservatives, or, yeah. right? Or people like so. Those are people. Yeah. Why is that? Why is that okay? Why are we okay with certain things? But then why are we on this kick of like, oh, if you do something like that, like that's just for. I think what happens like, is get the fuck out. Of here I think what happens. We're in a state right now where. Um, if you make it's if you make fun of someone for being, and this is true by the way, you come at me and debate me if you don't believe so. It's a hundred percent. JP true. Sears did a great yeah. YouTube on like this. Uh, I think it was a millennial one. Of, yeah. I'm offended that you're offended. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, so yeah. hilarious. No, no, no. This this statement I'm going to make is a hundred percent true right now. Hundred percent true. And we can debate as to why this is true, and that's a d good discussion. But what I'm about to say, there's no, there's a hundred percent. If I make fun of. Uh, the Christian religion, mm -hmm. white people, or men, or or all three of the above, straight white men who are Christians, I will get almost. Every, it's not a big. It's like open season. Yeah. If I say anything about anybody else in, in a joking manner or whatever, then uh, I, I I could get hammered and ripped and all that stuff. And I do understand. Now the argument is that everyone would argue that all the other people have been oppressed for so long, and then that those people have been celebrated for for so yeah, they long. call it like and punching so, up or whatever you yeah have to punch up you can't punch down well here's the way i look at it if one is okay then they're all okay or none of them are okay 
That's the that, that's the consistency. Hey, of we it. knew we knew it when I day, like the South Park approach. Day Make one, everybody, because exactly yeah, right. Day exactly. No, that's exactly mind pump too. That when yeah. day one when we all got together, we know how we knew how crude all of our humor was, right, and inappropriate that all of it was. That's how we are. Like that's and I want and we all agreed right that we wanted to be ourselves when we're on the show. And it's like, listen, we're going to put ourselves in the comedy. Yeah. Like, yeah, we're going to give some really good fitness information, put some science out there, put some really mm-hmm. intelligent conversations on this show. But at the same time, too. I want to have some fun and be and have Dude, some, and, and be. Well, we make fun of ourselves on a daily, right? So you right. know, on top of every single type of person, individual, like we're gonna make fun of you, Dude, Dude sorry, I it's gonna made, happen. I get made fun of daily in our forum. Yeah, me, forum members will make post a meme about me, you know, like talking shit, I know. And, and it's, it's endearing. Like I, 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 it's okay. I, I tend to make the thing. I'm like, I'm making fun of your voice or something. Like yeah. that, that's something because I like you. Yeah, you're you know what I mean. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> or like, I don't know. I sometimes it, that that like crosses my mind. Like we were talking, even with like well, tarot. It, from, it really annoys me. So like to like Sal's thing where they you know why? It. Because being being offended is empowering. That's why it feels empowering to someone. Like is that what I, it is? You're you're, you're see- that's what you're seeking. There? You're seeking power. To to claim you're a victim uh, is to say is to claim power over someone when you tell them. Like if I tell you, like if you're making a point to me and I'm like, you know what, I'm offended and you're being, you know, whatever, racist, sexist, or you're being oppressive towards me right now, and and you're just talking or whatever. I've now I've got the trump card. I've got the like it's the power over you. It's the same reason why. Here's why. It's the same reason why somebody who's 85 percent uh, of European descent and 15 percent uh, Native American descent descent will usually claim the Native American descent. They'll say to the, they'll say to people, "Oh, well, I'm I have a friend. Check this out. I have a friend who got a tattoo on her leg of this Native American headdress. Now she looks 100 percent Irish, but it's because she says that some aunt or something or some you know, whatever was was a, was a, a you know Native American. She did a 23 andme test, and guess what? She wasn't. She oh, wasn't no. at all. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't at all, and she wasn't raised that way. Backfire. Stuff. Yeah, it's like, you know. I, anyway, that sucks, dude. I'm not telling anybody after I get that tattoo uh, <laughs> yeah. because the tattoo ain't going away. Dude, dude. That process is revealing. I found out I'm like way more Scandinavian. I didn't even know I was Scandinavian at all. Yep. And I'm, it's like I'm like, man, the Vikings were fucking on a tear. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> they were in your like, country. They just they just took over. Like yeah. I bet you anybody that's European is like definitely Scandinavian. Yeah. <laughs> I, the, you know, and the other thing too is humor. There's different levels of humor. Humor can be very individual. What one person thinks is funny, one person thinks is not funny. Right. But I'll, and I'm not. I share this with a lot of people. I find very inappropriate type dark humor the most funny. We I all, love it when we people. All do. We all I love do. it when people cross lines <laughs> yeah. and say shit that you're not supposed to say. But I know it's lighthearted and they're not actually. Yeah, bad people. It's about the intent behind it. Well, yeah. because we've, we're like all if you if somebody, disruptors by heart. Like dude. if somebody's yeah. actually yeah. racist, I'm not going to associate it's myself not funny with at you. All. Yeah. If somebody's Fuck actually off. sexist, I think you're small minded and you're a piece of shit. Right. If somebody's actually you know hurtful or hateful, you're a piece of shit. If you're not and you're a good person and you make jokes. And you break the tension by saying things you know you're not exactly. supposed to, whatever. The tension that everybody yeah. has on a daily basis. Oh, they wake up and you know everything's so demanding. The world's out to get them. Like, let's lighten it up. That's right. it, dude. There's, there's. It's a sign of the times when comedians are afraid to perform at colleges. That's all I have to say. Like, Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Isn't that crazy? That's yeah. where we're at right now. That you have comedians that just can't even perform at college at colleges anymore because of their jokes. It's, yep. What the fuck? It's yep. terrible. That is the funniest shit I've ever heard. Yeah, yeah. It's not, and, and not literally it's the right. The cry closet thing. Yeah, so it's weird. It's just like you know, I don't know. And I what'd get, you, hey, what would you guys think? It take your, take your pills, dude. That was a Ooh, that was a crazy documentary. That's right. Yeah, we didn't Man. even talk about that. That was a I crazy. We, we all watched Take Your Pills. I watched it the night before, and I and I and uh, shout out to whoever has been DMing me. I've I've had a couple people uh, keep following up on me. Did you watch Take Your Pills? Did you watch Take Your Pills? We finally watched Take Your Pills. Mm-hmm. Actually, one of my favorite documentaries. Not they did just a really good job. Yeah, because it's done really well. It's actually really it's shot really well. Some of the, like what was it? We just watched one before that that I thought was just kind of like not well made. Well, and they didn't. It wasn't like all about how horrible you know the drug is that for the majority of the beginning it was like why it's so enticing and why you know why people have you know like been drawn towards it and and been using it you know in 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 like you know studying for tests and you know all these different reasons but it's just like then they get to the point where like okay well here's where it leads and here's the road that that it looks like i did not know the history 
behind ADHD and what oh. we used to call it. Oh, right. You know, back in the 30s. and Marginal and, brain damage. Right. That's what they called it. It was, To me- That was the name of ADD That was the most the like, holy shit. They changed it to ADD because no parent wants to take a kid and, and get diagnosed with that. They'd rather have ADD than they can- Prescribe right, no, yeah, no parents going to accept their kid is is half brain dead, yeah. you know, and because they named it that, that's scary. Which, by the way, obviously you're not, but, right. but that's what they called it. Right. That's and, what they called it. And it scared people away from agreeing that their kid could potentially have it. Now you give it something like ADHD, oh, my, my, my son or my daughter just has a hard time keeping in their attention. Yeah. That's not so bad. Like, okay, I and have no It was no so revealing, like, the parents' mentality towards, like, just completely, <laughs> oh, I just, you know, I heard, like, my friend does this with their kid, and then, you know, the doctor prescribes it so willingly, and they don't even, like, second guess that they're giving their child, like, medication and, like, what the ramifications are. It doesn't even do any back study on that. Yeah. I, it's, I was like, what? We're definitely in the middle of an amphetamine uh, epidemic. We have an opiate epidemic and amphetamine epidemic in terms of prescription drugs the amount of children right now we've exceeded the peak of methamphetamine use in the uh, in the u.s before now was in the 60s when it was just getting prescribed like crazy and it was getting prescribed to housewives businessmen people were getting injections of it um so because they've been around for a long time yeah now what is it called like sniff or snuff before it was not isn't that what that is the the buterol or the um oh uh, it was an inhaler ben, benza yeah benzadrine or benzadrine benzadrine, benzadrine. Yeah. wasn't that wasn't it the, the the street name or the the whatever it was called or like the short name for it was just snuff or sniff i think yeah. so it was for the bombers right in world war II. yeah but not only that but it was very popular with banking and businessmen yep. and stuff yeah, like well, that they kept it going you even see like they called it pep they yeah. use pep. increase your pep yeah, maybe that's what it was. Yeah. I know I know that it was... Po- I mean, you see it. People don't... Uh, so uh, an example right off the top of my head, but I know I've seen this multiple times. Um, Jim Carrey's Christmas Carol, the cartoon. Mm-hmm. There's a part in there where the uh, there's like three bankers. They're outside. You know, they're all cartoons. So, ah, they're laughing so that. And they're, they're about to go inside. And you see one of them put something up to his nose and <laughs> snort it. Looks like he takes a bump off of his, mm-hmm. off of his thumb. And, you know, if you catch that, you're like, what the fuck? Dude? That's a cartoon. You just did it. But... What it is, it's that stuff. It was the methamphetamine. Yes. That's the way they were getting it. Yeah, because it was so widely accepted. It was, and housewives were prescribed it so they could do more housework and be more peppy and up for their husbands or whatever, and men were using it in business. And then the meth, then you know, it became a, like a big street drug. It was called speed. They clamped down on it. Use dropped considerably until it became this big thing to prescribe people uh, these methamphetamines for ADD. And today, I don't know how many millions, I think, what was it like? One out of every 10 kids is diagnosed with ADD, and the vast majority of them By is six. on these medications. Yeah. By six years old. Ugh. Now, keep in mind, this is a drug that definitely has powerful influences dude, over you're brain giving chemistry. your kid speed by six years old, mm-hmm, dude. That's mm-hmm. fucking crazy. And here's the one that blew me away, because I know there's somebody listening right now who potentially probably has put their kid on ADHD or put them on this medication was the study that came out to show that it isn't doing anything to your brain. It doesn't far, make you smarter. Does not, yeah, it does not no. improve cognitive function. All it is, if you give somebody fucking speed, anybody's speed, with or without ADHD, makes all you these- good and confident. Yeah, it gives you it, this well-being, right? It makes you feel more- It comfort. makes you perceive yourself as being smarter. Right. Because they did a b- big study on this where they had- they Which I would, I would argue that if you gave a bunch of people Coke, the same thing would happen too. Yep, very yep. similar. Right. Very similar. Yeah, it, what, they, what they did is they, they placebo control controlled this where they gave some people uh, you know uh, Adderall or Ritalin and some people nothing and then they had them take these tests and they had baselines obviously they took the test without them and the scores were no better but the perceived you know the, the, the people perceived this themselves as being smarter did this pill make you or help you perform better on this Which test. Which anybody who's yes. done any sort of methamphetamine drug or cocaine or anything like that knows exactly that you feel fucking awesome while you you're do. on. Yeah, you, you do. feel fucking like Superman. That's right. And so th- there's that. It doesn't really help in that particular sense. And then the other thing is that you have a generation of children who go are going through school on this substance, going through college on this substance, and you've built this relationship with it where you think you need it. How do you how do you plan on coping in the real world yeah. when you know you get out of school or any time now when you have to handle difficult situations? One of the side effects, by the way, of methamphetamines is psychosis. Thank you. I was just going to bring that up. Like I, that that's what seriously worries me, especially how those numbers have inflated so much of usage, right? And like having kids starting so young and then using it 
for that amount of time, like, and it has some potential side effects for psychosis. Psychosis is a real meth heads, right? We know what they what they can do, what they're capable of. There's that stereotype. You are giving or you are taking a almost identical version of that in a lower dose and all that stuff, but it's still it's still a form of of, of meth. Um, but you know, we have millions of kids on methamphetamines. And millions of kids on SSRI drugs, which are serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which you know influence the serotonin system in the brain for things like depression, anxiety, whatever. And what's the biggest problem like we face right now? You you see these kids doing crazy, terrible shit. You know, we talk about these these shootings in schools. Didn't you say that they're trying to connect that to that right now? There's they have been. They've been talking about this because look, here's the deal: like guns. What? It's not the guns. Well, guns have been a part of American culture from day one, so they've been around for a long time. And it's a relatively recent phenomenon. I say relatively because it's not like recent as in recent like this decade. This, you know, these types of things have been happening since the 1960s. In fact, in the 1990s, we saw uh, gun, you know, school shootings were actually higher than they are today. But since then, we've seen kind of this kind of phenomenon where every once in a while you see a kid going up to a school or whatever and shoot up a school. And it's like, what the fuck's going on? Look, guns have been around for since day one in America. It was part of the con- part I know. Of our we, Bill and we try and when we try and point it towards bullying and things like that too. It's like, come on, dude. No, that, kids are going been, crazy. Kids have been bullying kids since we were kids. Yeah. It's worse, probably and way worse. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, kids. Some some of these kids are going crazy and getting that level of psychosis. And I'm not saying that they are the cause of it, but there's definitely there could be some potential there. Like, let's take a look. You, if you take, let me put it this way. Yes, yeah, studies will show that Ritalin, Adderall, SSRIs in studies don't typically cause these problems although small percentage may right especially for susceptible mm. but now spread that out over millions tens of millions of kids right well now all you need is like one yeah. or two kids to lose their shit and do some crazy shit like epigenetics something like expresses you know the and it, and it like creates that the potential is well, there potential like, especially yeah, when you're looking at numbers wise how many how many tens of thousands or millions of kids millions, millions of kids that are now on that dude yep. that's crazy this is me. why this is why you know when we talk about herbs and stuff like that and i and i'm always saying like look there may be at the moment there's no science supporting that this herb does this however it's been used in this particular culture for five thousand years so it's been established in that culture that it helps with whatever stomach ailment cough you know, uh, immune system, whatever. So figure 5,000 years means millions and millions of people have used it over that period of time. Right. Now, when the when we do drug testing, even the most rigorous drug testing, you're looking at thousands of people in studies. Mm-hmm. The real test is when we put it on the market and then we start to see millions and millions of people use them. Then you start to see little weird things start to express themselves. And this is why FDA approved drugs get taken off the market every day. Mm-hmm. Like these are things that went through the whole rigorous process of going through all the most, I mean, the FDA has the most rigorous process of regulating and approving drugs in the world but by yet, far. still some get pulled off. Still, we'll have a drug that's that all of a sudden, oh, we got to pull it off, looks like it causes dementia, you know, or oh, yeah. we got to pull this off the market, looks like it causes heart problems, you know? So, you know, these are all, you know, drugs that affect the brain. You're putting a bunch of children on it. It's definitely affecting neurotransmitters, which definitely affect how the brain develops. You put enough kids on it, you, you're going to see some weird shit maybe potentially Well, I tell happen. you what, if you're a parent that's ever even considered doing this or you are doing this with a kid, like this watch is that a, documentary. absolutely yeah, have to, to watch, watch this documentary. I think it's it explains it really, really Look, well. Look, you know, I've taken, I've tried and taken uh, Adderall and Ritalin. Okay? Yeah, it's so awesome, I, I've tried them. And when I took them, the, like the first time I tried an Adderall, I was like, okay, like I could see why this this is an addictive substance. Mm-hmm. You get a very you know pronounced feeling of euphoria and confidence and whatever. My God, if I was raised on that, I would have a difficult time functioning without it because I would build up my confidence right. based on that. You yeah. know, like what do I do now? Like yeah, what how do I do develop? You know, and like especially socially too. You know, like that's tough, man. Plus, think about it this way. They said this on the on the sh- on the documentary, which I thought was brilliant. The ability to deal with emotions, to deal with boredom, to deal with lack of motivation, to deal with these challenges, mm-hmm. a lot of times that's where creativity comes from. That's where growth comes from. That's where you know all these incredible ideas that we see brilliant minds come up with. A lot of times they come up from those states of mind. They don't come from someone feeling really good, motivated, and focused on one thing. They come from those other states of mind. Like how many artists and musicians 
you know, are we going to, what, what are we going to be creating in the future for all medicated to be these focused robots who can complete these organized tasks? You know what I mean? Right. It's, it's, it's just really scary to me. And the the millions of children that are on it and people. Yeah. Well, it's so competitive, right? And like a lot of parents get stuck into the trap of like setting their child up for success so early and like have like doing all these things like perfect because it's, you know, like so and so is doing it. And, you know, I have to make sure that my child can have the edge and the competitiveness. And it's like they're all competing for what to be a better student. Oh, how about the How about the what was it a sixth grade or I don't or even younger the teacher that when the kid got transferred to that school it was like a um like a private school or whatever mm. and she said the first day of school she had brought her kid there that she asked if he was on any if he, he needs on, to be on medication yeah because every kid in the class makes your job easier as a teacher <sighs> imagine you have a whole kid on adderall a whole classroom on adderall the kids are going to be very they can sit and focus they're going to sit do their work listen to what you're saying be very focused maybe you know and and you know that makes your your job easier but then you got a bunch of Test takers. I wonder how many teachers are were are were actually doing that. You know, what I'm saying that's. Mm. I didn't even think that that of that. Like, oh wow, how many teachers would love for their kids to be just medicated like that? So their job is look, that much look, easier. Look here, like, we that's know that's fucking scary. Look, we that. know here for a fact. This is not my opinion. This is 100 percent confirmed. Okay, if you get kids and you and you you reduce their activity tremendously, so they're not playing outside, they're not expressing themselves physically, they're sitting down in a classroom, on a desk, or watching TV or on a computer all day long, plus you combine that with a shitty diet and lots of distractions, it's going to express itself as hyperactivity or inability to focus or irritability or whatever. Right. Bottom line. Get your kid. I know, Look, I got two kids. I see it all the time. Get them outside exercising to come in. All of a sudden, yeah. they're way easier to manage totally. and more calm, especially when you change your diet and all that stuff. So it's that whole, like, it's an easy... And I know, look, I know there's kids out there that need medical intervention i get that but do we really think one tenth of all the children in america fuck no have a have the have this medical diagnosis that it's real or that it's an actual issue or it might be the environment you know as far as like education like how how we're teaching them things and like you know getting them up and moving and all that is part of the process dude some of the ads they were showing for for these drugs oh, for kids. So dirty. Yeah. So, so dirty. bad. It's, so dirty. Yeah, like, oh, thanks, mom. I can do my homework now. It's like, oh, shit. They're selling it as, hey, give this to your kids so they can perform better so you feel better about... I don't know, man. It's... It's 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 creepy. It's a little It's a little bit... Um, it's alarming. It's a little unnerving. Um, it's, it's the typical Western approach, right? We want to take away all the challenges of life and make life feel easier, right? Like... Right. I was having this so I was having this conversation the other day with uh, with Jessica and t- we were I don't remember what was what we were doing we were watching something and it was like it was a movie showing you know like seventeen year old girl talking to another seventeen year old boy or whatever and we I was laughing because how much more emotionally evolved and advanced girls tend to be at the same age as boys just a fact like yep. girls are just emotionally far more intelligent than boys are at a young age. And it takes men typically a long time to start to approach that that level. And so me and Jessica were talking about this and, and speculating as to why. Why is this? I understand the evolutionary purpose of it, potentially, what, what we think. But like, why are girls, why do girls advance so much faster with their understanding of emotions and themselves than boys do? And the the thing that we came up with was because girls at a young age go through dramatic hormone fluctuations. And so it's like they're put through the ringer. They have to become emotionally intelligent because yeah. one minute their estrogen is- homeostasis again. Well, they just have to learn how to deal with it. Like yeah. imagine if you were, as a, imagine as a boy at the age of 11 or 10, like your hormones just fluctuate. Like you have to learn how to deal with that. And you, you become smart mm-hmm. on dealing with emotions as a result. Whereas boys- we're like we, we get horny and we you know, I'm sure puberty hits, but it's kind of like easy and the same. So for us, it's like duh, everything's kind of easy, right? So we we're kind of dumb in that sense, and it's that it's that going through that challenging process that is one of the reasons I think why women and girls in particular just are so much more emotionally intelligent and empathetic than boys at the same age. Oh, you think so? I definitely think so. I think, mu- I think much of that goes all the way back to like when they're just early on ages too i think just being seeing your mother and and connecting that way too it could i think all of those things but like imagine if you had to go i do i know i i I definitely like you just went through having uh low testosterone right right right. how much did you evolve 
right. because you had to do that. You no, know? so I so I do I do somewhat agree with you. I think that there there for sure has something to do with that, like having to manage your hormones at a young age when you're forced to as a kid. You got to kind of gather yourself, right? You can't be this. You can't go to school ever if you're a, a young teenage girl. You can't go to school every day and fucking scream at everybody every time you fucking yeah, feel like emotion, what's going right? on, right? Or else you'll be an outcast. Yeah. So my point, forces you to kind of evolve. And that my way. my point with all that is now girls are being placed on birth control at, at young ages and women um, and or placed on SSRI drugs to control the 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 bad effects of the hormones like the PMS or the moodiness or whatever you want to call it like I know you know how many women are prescribed SSRIs and, and anxiety medications cuz around their period around their PMS cuz they it helps them you know normalize it yeah or whatever yeah. like you're taking that away and that's again what we're doing with the medication for hyperactive kids like rather than learning how to handle it manage it look at other options and maybe what that can contribute to well, we're like always, take this pill in life we're always it. trying to skip the hard part yeah. when, when reality that's where the lesson lies right i think that's all it's, yep. there's a lesson in that so much i know <laughs> i always take the hard road man because that, that's just the thing the low le- the road less just travel. learn road less travel just learn from Some it Robert I guess. Frost for you. this clause brought to you by organifi for those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. All right, our first qu- question is from Diary of a Fit Guy. How do each of you structure your training during periods of heavy travel? That's our boy, man. It's yeah, been a, that's it's right. Been a minute since uh, he's asked the question. He has, yeah. He's a good guy. Um, dude, travel. We're 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 now starting to really learn how to kind of manage this, I guess. Um, but when you're when you're traveling, depending on for us at least, we sleep less. We're more stressed out because we're obviously traveling to do an event or to, to podcast with other people. So it's a little bit more, we may all look at pressure. This, we may all look at this differently. Yeah. Too. It's just, it's just different challenges. So I guess I'll speak for myself personally. I try to prioritize some exercise, um, at, at least like, let's say if we're gone for five days, I'll try and get at least two or three scheduled workouts. I try to get to bed or at least get a decent amount of sleep during that period of time, but I'm not working out to, <clears throat> Like maximize my performance as much. I'm just doing it to maintain myself yeah. so I can. I would echo that as far as the intensity goes. Like I definitely save my more intense days for when I'm consistent and I'm here and I'm not traveling. Versus when I'm traveling, it's 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 nice if like you know if, if we have it so it's structured where there's free time and like okay well great now we can go to a gym that's close by or we can figure something out that's going to be movement. Um, based like some activity because I do, man, I hate sitting. I hate sitting and I hate doing things um, where I'm inactive. My body just really just, it, it, I start to f- not feel good. Like mm-hmm. it, it really affects me. So um, anything I can do to, to get in the sun, you know, to get out, uh, you know, in nature and, and uh, just move is, is, is a success, you know, when I'm traveling. But yeah, I love I love it when we, we make time to actually like, you know, get like a light workout in at least because then I feel my, my body just feels better. My energy levels are better when we go into podcast or do work wherever we are, you know, when we're traveling. But yeah, that's that's become a big thing. If we can at least get like a moderate kind of a workout in while we're there. Maps Maps Anywhere is perfect for this. I yeah. mean, that's that's part of the reason why we designed it was to create workouts that can be done anywhere, hence the name Maps Anywhere. And uh, I love, because I don't do a shit ton of body weight training and, and tension work on my own. But when we travel, that's when I'll take that opportunity. Like when we when we went out, when we traveled with uh, Robert Oberst, you know, there's a couple times we went outside and got a workout. We got some actually good photos out of that too. But we took bands with us and we did band exercises and body weight stuff and uh, mobility type stuff. And so, you know, I, I kind of take it sometimes as an opportunity to do things that I may not normally do with my body if I'm in my home gym and stuff like that. And uh, it just feels so much better. I don't really, I don't really stress about it that much. I, the biggest thing that uh, I think that we've gotten much better about, and I think that we've we've figured out, is the eating piece. That was probably the most mm. challenging mm-hmm. thing. Is what was when we first started traveling. It was like, you know, I I f- could feel myself wanting to just fall off the wagon. Like, oh, we're traveling, we're out like this, like, and we I especially when we were first doing this because I was competing. 
And so it was like, oh, this is nice. This is like a cheat weekend for me, or yeah. I'm not going to worry about anything and just eat whatever. But then I ended up feeling miserable because Justin and I would eat pizza or something <laughs> like that, right? <laughs> so, dude, I was like, yeah, you'd, you'd always pull me in. I would for the kill. I would. Yeah. It's an easy he's target. He's an easy, he's one. An easy target. <laughs> Damn it, Adam. <laughs> But so here's the thing. It, it all depends on my, my goals. Like I'm not competing right now. If I was in the middle of competing, I would make it a priority. I would get up before the boys wake up in the morning. I would go. We're always near a gym somewhere or we do have our bands with us. Where we have things that I can do to keep my fitness going. But sometimes if anything, like for for me, this is me speaking for myself. I, I, I probably flirt more with being the obsessive workout person more so than I am the guy that like doesn't ever work out, right? So when I go into a weekend like this where we're traveling, my priorities just shift. It's like this is we're in business mode. We're doing something like that. So yeah. my thought process is around that. So I want to do more recuperative type stuff. So if I'm gonna I don't even want to train a hard session. Like I have no desire to I I'm I'm normally the guy if anyone that is pushing back like nah I don't really want to go to the gym. Like I have no desire to go hammer myself inside the gym while we're already flying in planes, sleeping in other people's beds. Like that to me is not, I'm already stressing my body with that. And we're, we have pressures of, oh, we're going to, I'm going to be standing up and speaking to people tomorrow. Like my brain's going a million miles an hour on other stuff. So the gym to me and going to, to work out because I want to look a certain way isn't as much of a priority. So getting some maybe band work. I mean, when we go to Texas, we always, we always have a pool. So I'll, I was doing when, and I'm rehabbing my Achilles steel. So I was doing pool work on my Achilles. I got bands in my, in my bedroom. So I'm doing some, mm -hmm. you know, stuff for my posture, but it's not really hardcore training. Now, if you have a hard, like, and I, and I know he trains. So I, so I could see where the question is coming from for you, like how to, okay. If you're getting ready to compete, like, well, yeah, like if I was getting ready to compete, I, I would, I would, I would literally leave the guys if I had to and go get my own, you know, session that I need to keep my body on pace for stage ready in, you know, X amount of weeks before I get on there. And it, and I would make the time, even if I would make the time, even if I knew it isn't what's best for my overall health, because my goals are different because my goals are, I've got a competition. I've got to present myself a certain way within six weeks. I can't miss this workout. It's scheduled. It's part of my volume. It's part of everything that I've planned out. I, I will, if that means I got to get up at 5 a.m. and train before everyone gets up or I got to stay up late and go train at midnight, mm -hmm. I'm going to do so. But that's not me being, trying to be balanced and healthy. Like I'm in a different space mm -hmm. right now. And so I'm thinking of, okay, we just flew for four hours, time change difference. Uh, we're, you know, getting up early tomorrow morning to do a seminar or something like that. You know, could I go squeeze the gym in? Like, yeah, I could, but it's not a priority for me right, right there. And, and if I choose to eat the right foods, which is, this is why I started with this, that that's the most important thing to me right now. If I choose to make sure that I make healthy choices nutritionally, that I'm going to be just fine. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, in fact, my body will probably it probably serve me to not train for yeah, a, a I, couple of days. I, I look at it like when I train as I'm traveling. Well, there's two things. First off, I do personally fully enjoy working out in different places. It's just a fun thing from always always have. So if I'm traveling somewhere, I do like to find different gyms. I don't care what gym it is, even if it's a hotel gym. For whatever reason, I have a lot of fun doing that. Mm -hmm. But I also you know, like Adam, I view the workout not as to improve my performance. It's really just to, you know, because usually when we travel, we work more, a lot more. Right. So it's really just to make me perform better at that. So right, right, a yeah. break, move my body, feel real good. It could be 30 minutes. Usually that's what it is. Right. I love when we do like every now and then, like when we're in on it, we go do the sauna, we do things like yeah. that. We, when we're using yeah. It, yeah. mobility and then, yeah. It's like more recuperative. The sauna like our training when we travel is, is more recuperative, yep, I think. Yep. And so and what I do too is if, if I know we're going to be gone for about three or four days, which is typically the length of our travel, then what I'll do is I'll lead into that with a little overreach. Right, right. So I really push it hard the days leading up to that's it. That's easy to do. And then knowing I- That's that, something we all do. That's going to be a rest. That's something we all have in common. Yeah. We all get a really good training session, even though it's not together. We all get our uh, get a good lift in before mm -hmm. we head off. But there are people you know, listening who travel is a is like half their life. You know what I mean? Like They, they have a job where 
Yeah. Where it's literally 50%. That's a, that's a very good point. Totally different and that's, scenario. That's where Maps Anywhere was created. It totally. was created for that person. Yeah. It is not created, even though you can still use it. Okay. There's two people I really, I personally envision when we did Maps Anywhere. It was either one, like you just said, Sal, someone who spends almost 50% of their time traveling. So therefore, they need a good workout yeah, they that they can a, do anywhere. Right. They need a good workout that they could do absolutely. And then, then there's the other person who might be a competitor, like Sean is. So this is, he's an example of this person who, how I would use Maps Anywhere. Anywhere, is you don't you you can't sacrifice any muscle. You're you got to be building. You have a show in twelve weeks or whatever, so you got to stay on pace. But then you might be traveling and gone for four or five days, like, and you might be in a ho- stuck in a hotel room because you're doing banquets or banquet style type shit or whatever. So if you're that person, like I definitely see Maps Anywhere being an excellent mm-hmm. tool for that person. Now, if you're just a normal person who's chasing overall health and want to be fit and strong, like. You mean nutrition is number one? Watch. I think the biggest thing that people fuck up is nutrition when they're traveling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When you're traveling, for sure, nutrition is the hardest, hardest thing. And being yep. okay with one fasting. Okay, that this is also what we do a lot. Taylor hates to travel with all of us. <laughs> yeah, because we this we is, don't eat. No, we just don't eat. We just all go. This is a great time for us to incorporate it's lunch, fasting, <laughs> and we'll just we'll work all day and not eat. So therefore, again, if if that's where we're at, if we're flying. Not sleeping the best. We're we're also not consuming a lot of food. Like really getting into the gym and getting a major workout is probably yeah. not even that ideal. I will say this though: of all the, and I know you guys will, I'm sure you guys will agree, of all the programs and stuff we sell, the one that shocks people the most, most underrated for sure, is, is Maps, Maps Anywhere. Yeah. yeah, who is it? Christina Rice. Christina Rice yes. just just did, and that's the one that train. When we get trainers that actually go through it, they're like, "Oh fuck, like, this wow, is dude." This you can. I'm telling you right now, awesome. the way we wrote that program, and I Paul, and and, and no, uh, she was laughing because the where we, where we filmed it in that house. <laughs> that's right. And we did that on purpose to show that you could do this in a house. By the way, Christina. and we were kind of being silly as yeah, we were doing yeah. it. Yeah. But the but if you and we had a very low budget back yeah. then, we had a very low budget. <laughs> but <laughs> we didn't have any models. The, I was doing some weird stuff. The way you we wrote the program was how could we make this as effective as a routine that uses weights or as close as we can as possible? And I think we did a fucking good job. So when you follow the program, because there's all I know there's a lot of people listening too who just don't want to go to a gym. They just don't want to work out with weights. They want to work out, but they don't want to do it in a gym. They just want to do it at home. Like it will blow you away. We wrote it in a way that it's gonna be super effective. So you can get a lot of progress without any equipment. You just have to be smart with how you program your workout. Next question is from Joe Pushner. Are there some things to try when someone feels like they may actually be sliding backwards, even when their programming and nutrition have been consistent with what got results before? Well, wait a second. Are there some things? Yeah, like what can you do? Let's say you've, you've, you're, you've been consistent. Like this stuff's worked with for you before. Your workout's worked for you before. Nutrition's worked for you before. But all of a sudden, your body's your body's not progressing. Maybe oh, going this is actually really common in the competitive world. Really, really common. So I see this a lot with uh, guys. I mean, I remember having lots of conversations with my peers of like, man, I'm I'm on the exact same amount of macro. My macros are the same. I'm training just as hard. My cardio is the same. I'm doing all these things, and like my by my body is just not responding well. It's just not my, it's not responding well to what the, the same stimulus. And so that a lot of times is what it is. It's just this is a result for at least from what my experience and a lot of what I've seen is the overtraining and and constantly hammering the body the same way for a long period of time and it's just got very adapted and efficient and so just because you're eating good and you're training good if it's something that you've been doing a lot or similar to that for a very long time yeah. you're seeing minimal to no results from it it's actually huh. very common and even more common in the people that are cons- even more consistent you would think as a competitor that these guys and girls don't have a hard time with this this is actually a common issue that i see and i thought that it was something that blew my mind is what i would the only way that i would see these guys change in girls is two things, the two variables that they would know how to really change, and that was they would either ramp up more cardio, which is always crazy to see, or more drugs. Diet less. Yeah, it was. Or, it, it would yeah, be less it would calories. Be, yeah, strict. But you can only go so far with that, right. right? Like every everybody knows, like oh shit, look, I'm down to eating fifteen hundred calories. Like I'm already. But yeah, they'll they'll still do it because those are like the two metrics that like it, t- people tend to kind of be susceptible towards. Like those are the only two things that are going to change my body. Dude, this, this happens with everybody. This is the same thing with people with with wellness. Like hey. I, I, this diet's always made me feel real good. Now all of a sudden I'm inflamed and I have gut issues. Like what's going on? Here's the thing you need to understand. Your body's not the same. 
It's not the same today as it was yesterday. Definitely not the same a year from now it is today and 10 years from now. So what you did before worked for that particular version of your body and that particular combination of circumstances that you were under. Today, it's not working for you. So try different things. This is why I don't like classes. And I, I, know, I know I hammer things like Orange Theory and boot camps and stuff like that a lot because you know, the first time that you signed up for Orange Theory or the first time you signed up for Joe's boot camp and you started doing it and you decided to get on your diet and do that, you saw phenomenal results and you told all your girlfriends and you told all your friends, you got to try this class out. It's fucking awesome. I look great. Everybody's complimenting you. And then a year goes by, two years goes by and you do just like what everybody does on and off the wagon. You're, you're really good about your class and eating. Then you're not so good. Then you're really good. Not so good. And then what you're starting to notice year over year is like, fuck, each time I do this, I'm not getting back to that first shape that I got into. And that's a vicious cycle. To Dude, me. it's so interesting. Interesting because there's also the parallel with I see this all the time when I go do pickup games like with basketball or you know like a lot of guys like are, are like soccer or something like that like I was in phenomenal shape and so I would just go play you know pickup games again and start trying to get in shape like I get that all the time like I'm trying to get in shape again and it's like not working for them yeah yeah you know? it's just like like you know you, your body literally needs a new stimulus yeah and and you need to step out of your comfort zone and 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 get you know get your body to respond and, by doing something different. Yeah, and and I at, have theories on the nutrition side too that I yeah. just I don't think we know enough about that too that I think that why would it be any different? I talked about this a long time ago on, on Mind Pump I've been in, a, in, in a while and that is like why would I think it's any different if I am feeding myself consistently same types of times I'm prepping my meals I'm doing all this over and over and over just same way like if I were to do that with a training program why would I not think that my body would not get adapted to that same theory that I have on mm -hmm. people that intermittent fast every single day. It's like, you know, intermittent Doesn't count after a while, right? Probably. I think after a while, the 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 results or the benefits, the benefits yeah, start to diminish, reduce. right? So why would it be any different for nutrition as it is for programming? So honestly, you know, I, I think the mistake that someone that like I have, and I don't know who this person is who's asking this question, right? It's tough for us to be certain without me actually really sure. having more information like what have you been doing for the last year two three years and what is your programming nutrition looks like but a lot of people think just because yeah and let's say you had maps like say you had maps red like you have maps red which is a great program and you are following some carb cycling diet that works for you but you've been doing that for the last three years always over and over and over and over after a while like yeah, you're just because those both. Well, those even are, using Sal's an example of like figuring out about histamines, you know, all of a sudden, like, you, you know, you're doing everything right, like beforehand, right. but then you realize that this, you know, could be, you know, if you're, if you're introducing it too much, it could be problematic yeah, in a different angle. My body gave me some signals. And if I was hard headed and I'm like, no, this has always worked. Keep going forward. Not going to work. You're just going to keep getting louder and louder signals that it's not going to work. So you just got to. Listen, look, here's, here's the deal. When it comes to programming, let's start with that. When it comes to programming, there's this wide breadth or this big uh, category of things that can contribute towards your goal. So let's say your goal is to build muscle. Okay, your maximum goal is build muscle. What rep ranges build muscle? Most of them. Most of them will build, build muscle on your body if it's a new stimulus. And when I say most, I mean under like the crazy, like under 30 reps or under 25 reps, right? All those muscle building ranges, like one to five reps, you know, eight to 12, whatever. Take what your programming is now and go on a different one. So if you're if you're training 15 reps on everything or 12 reps on everything, try a, a few weeks of, you know, one to five reps. Or if you're always one to five reps, try the 15 reps for a few weeks. So there you go right there. All of them contribute to building muscle, but they're very different, so change it that way. Nutrition, here's another example. Let's say you've always eaten keto and it just works great for you. Now all of a sudden, God, when I go keto, I can't get that lean or whatever. Just try eating some carbs. Throw some carbs in there. Don't go crazy, but you know, throw some carbs in there. See how your body responds. <coughs> Mix it up a little bit and see what happens. Whatever you're doing isn't working anymore. And it's not because of what you're doing in the sense that it's the same thing that you've always been doing. It's that you're applying it to a different body, different circumstances, different set of circumstances, in which case... Time to try something different. That's the also good to look at other factors that we haven't really touched on too, because I've seen stuff like this where someone is doing really good programming, doing all the right things, but then 
stress and sleep is fucking just happens to be bad in their life right now. And they mm-hmm. think, oh, I'm doing the same stuff. Right, right. Like, yeah. like you, have, they have this big like emotional thing that happened. Either they lost a family member or gone through a divorce or something really, really stressful in their life, and they're kind of carrying that burden. And then maybe they're not sleeping very well, or their job they've got a new a new stimulus mentally there. People don't realize how much that could really affect the results that you're used to getting. You know, maybe before you were in a much better mental, physical state going into this programming and nutrition. And this time that's out of whack. And so you got to evaluate some of those things too. So there's many variables that could Mm -hmm. be going into the causing this person to not see the results that they're used to, but it is more common than you think. And this is also why all the program, this is why the super bundle is probably the most popular bundle that we sell because we we've tried to hammer home the hammer home the importance of rotating through different adaptations mm-hmm. it's just even though we know that we've sectioned them to market to a specific type of person like performance is supposed to go towards an athlete but that doesn't mean that if you're just an average joe who doesn't want to play sports you shouldn't do performance performance is a type of ad- adaptation that you should incorporate into your training if you want to continue to see progression and results that would be a great thing so if you're somebody who has one of the maps programs and you're following it because you most identified with that one because you heard Sal say MAPS Anabolic is heavily strength-based or a great foundational program. So now you're following that because you think you fall in that category. And you category. follow it over and over yeah, and over. Yeah, and you over. keep following it over and over again. It's like, no, go over to the performance one, even if you don't think of yourself as an athlete. And the mm-hmm. same thing goes for the aesthetic. Like, mm-hmm. Even if you don't care that much about aesthetics, doesn't mean that that modality or that adaptation is not going to highly benefit you. So you should be constantly cycling. You should. And, and this is a lesson that I have been taught <laughs> So many times in my fitness career, so many times will I do something new or try something and it works and then I marry it and I'm stuck on it. And I'm like, this is what works. I'm just going to do this. And it's like, it has to get to the point where it's so painfully obvious. We're like, oh, wow. Not only does it not work anymore, I'm going backwards. Then I have to kind of change out of it. And luckily I'm open-minded enough uh, to do so. But I learned this lesson, I mean, early on when I first started lifting, I was doing ridiculous amounts of volume. So then I read Mike Menser's Heavy Duty, and I was like, oh, one set to failure per body part, try that. And then I did that, and of course my body responded. Mm. So what do you think I did forever until yeah, I, right, I learned right. that lesson? Then I did that. And then I, so many times have I learned that lesson in my life where it's like, look, when your body's telling you it's not working anymore, switch it up, change mm. it out, watch what happens, throw something different at your body, and that backward slide should oh the stop sooner you can get ahead of it, you know the the more likely you're going to keep the key. progressing. Right. So yeah, you just have to be open minded to that and and you know really try it out. Next question is from My Fit Food Diary. How should one begin reintroducing calories after prolonged restriction without the fear of gaining too much fat? Oh, this is a good question that we just addressed with uh, Lane. Yeah, when's the Lane episode go up? Sunday. Okay. Oh, so, so this is this is cool. So yeah. this is goes right before and then then the lane. So, so we, he we brought, get into some. So we get in a little bit more. He detail. brought up some new science that I've done a little bit of reading on, and which is fucking fascinating. So here's the deal. Here's how it works. And they did this with animals, and they think this is what's happening with humans as well. When you go on a diet, uh, when you restrict your calories or go on a calorie deficit, you you actually lose body fat, obviously. And what happens is your fat cells shrink. Now we used to think that there are only a few times in life when you can actually add num- the number of fat cells to your body. One of them is during puberty. Another one would be uh, during the third trimester of pregnancy. A woman might add fat cells you know, when you're a baby or whatever. But other than that, it was pretty much believed that your fat cells just grew and shrank and that was it and you didn't add more fat cells to your body. But what they found was is when they put animals on calorie restriction – uh, fat cells shrank, and then if they re- if they started feeding them a lot right away, the body will will gain that weight back. So let's say the let's say uh, the mouse lost ten grams of uh, of body weight. They gave them more food, got their body weight up to ten grams, but it wasn't through the fat cells growing. It was from adding new fat cells, and then they would and then what happens is those fat cells will then try and reach the old size that they were before, so they gain an additional two grams or whatever. So this is fascinating because this is what this is telling us is this concept of severe restriction and then binging. And the reason why so many people find it harder to get lean after they continue doing the cycle, and we see this in competitors all the time, mm-hmm. where, they, where they restrict themselves, get super shredded, then post-competition they binge eat. Right, the old and, Krispy Kreme. Yeah, and then they do this two, three, four times, and all of a sudden they're like, I can't get lean like I used to. 
it's because you you may be adding the number of fat cells to your body. You may be making mm-hmm. it more difficult. Now, evolutionarily speaking, this makes sense because what your body's trying to do is improve upon its ability to capture all these calories. And capture energy. To, right. to, to pr- so that way, the next time a famine comes, you're even That's right. more likely to succeed. So the best way to reintroduce cal and the cool thing about this is we've been giving the right advice all along before we even knew the science. Right. The thing that I would I used to always say, and now is even strength, strengthened even more from these new studies, is reintroduce calories slowly. That's how you prevent lots of fat gain. Like, don't go from eating 1,200 calories to 2,500 calories right out the gates. Increase it by 150 or 100 or 50 even, and little by little increase the calories on a week by week basis and monitor your body. That'll prevent the addition of fat cells to your body. And he did. And and he said gain muscle. that there wasn't like definitive um, as far as like being able to get rid of those new fat cells. Like they don't you know, know if that they even don't know happens. if that even happens yet. Right? No, they don't even yeah. know. So you may be stuck with these new fat cells. So that's. I mean, that's alarming. That's so right. personally, what I like to do is I I like to use either rice or I like to use sweet potato. I find that's just really easy for me to measure and to control. And I like to I like to structure it around my workout. So if I'm on a reverse diet, which was something that I'd be on after every single show because I just depleted myself, came all the way down, and I'd have to reintroduce calories. How low would your calories get, by the way? Pre- the lowest I would ever, 2,000, 2,200. Okay. Yeah, that would be really low for me when I was competing. Now, it's, the irony is now that like that to me now is a very normal place to be. Like It's not a dieting place because mm-hmm. I have way less lean body mass sure. on me today than I do uh, did, did just two years ago. So back then, you know, my metabolism was roaring. I was eating 4,500 to 5,000 calories just to maintain my size. So 2,200 was really low. I mean, that, and that was like when I was getting into my final week, right? right. So I would, I would tailor off anywhere from 500 to 1,000 calories or so and just start chipping away like every week as I would get mm-hmm. closer into my show and then increasing my NEAT. And then post-show, I would start to reintroduce the calories and I would, again, use sweet potato or uh, rice. And that's just personal preference for me. There are two things that I was you know, making a lot of in bulk. Those, I, it's easy for me to make sweet potatoes and, and white rice in bulk. It's easy for me to weigh and measure those and go, okay, I was getting four ounces before. Now I'm getting six ounces. Now I'm getting eight ounces. And I would try and add, for me, 50 to 75 calories worth of carbohydrates around my my workouts so pre or post workout and i would slowly do that and i'd watch it so i'd pick a number whether it be 50 to 70 i'd add it in every single day around my workouts i'd i'd monitor my weight i'd monitor the way i look i'd monitor everything for about a week and as long as i felt that i wasn't aggressively adding weight i would pretty much do that almost every week Mm -hmm. and because i had a pretty healthy metabolism i could do every week i was increasing my calories now this is and this is a hard question to answer specific numbers like that this is why i'm using so different from person right that's why i'm using myself as an example so some people can try and give maybe give themselves a baseline from that because every client that I've trained, we've had different experiences. I've had some female clients. I've been able to give them a hundred plus calories almost every single week, and it's just I keep adding and adding, and adding. I remember Rochelle. Rochelle, when I was uh, coaching her when she was competing, man, she she came and she came off. She came to me when we first met, and it was over uh, her training with a, a, a bad trainer before that was trying to starve her body, and so we had kind of rebuilt her metabolism. And once we had rebuilt it and it was thriving, it was nuts. I was like feeding her. And more of calories, more calories, pumping more and more calories to where to where we were pushing her up to three thousand calories for. And you've seen her; she's petite. You know, she's mm-hmm. like a hundred and fifteen pound female. She doesn't weigh a lot at all. So yeah, everyone's going to be very different, you know. And then I've had clients that are guys that have competed in many many shows, and they've kind of fucked their metabolism a little bit. And I give them a little bit over, and then they, their body starts to add body fat. Yeah. So, and then there's the other thing too is you got to. And we talk about this with Lane is. You know, if you're okay in this reverse diet with adding a little bit of body fat, it's okay. You know what I'm saying? It's not a big deal if you're adding calories and you put a little bit of body fat on the way. That's It's more likely you're going to do that. It's tough to be Especially per- if you were shredded to go into yeah, it. Exactly. It, and it would be- it's That's actually, actually what you want. Yeah. It's actually probably healthy for you to put a, little, put a little bit of body fat. I'm just looking- For me, as I'm looking at competitors or I'm looking at myself, I'm trying to make sure that I'm, most of it's not body fat. Like I, I wouldn't want to be adding so many calories that- I'm adding fat like faster than I'm adding any sort of muscle or anything. Yeah, yeah. Way. It's it's it, the I mean the the right answer is just slowly take your time, um, and we know now why uh, it's a bad idea um, just from a scientific standpoint to just binge and force feed yourself or not even force feed yourself just go crazy with nutrition uh, right after a, a you know restriction. 
it may set you up for a more difficult process in the future. So just slowly you, scale it if up. If you are, a, a, another thing that I've used as a strategy, so I use myself as an example with the rice and the sweet potatoes, I've also flipped that with different people who are who have a challenge. They're like, they are great. They have major cravings and they're coming out. Those people I tend to use fat as the the calories that I'm, uh, where I'm going to get my calories from because it tends to satiate them a little mm. bit more. So, you know, you know, that's another thing that, again, there's no like, rule like, oh, you should use this or only use that. And I, you'll hear us talk to Lane about this a little bit because everyone is so unique and different. If you're struggling to where it's like, oh my God, I'm hungry all the time, maybe fat would be a better choice than actually using something like mm. a carbohydrate. Next question is from Andrew Reif, PT. What are the best tips and tricks you guys learned in terms of client retention? Is, is learned, what do we learn? Is learned a word? <laughs> I, I, believe, think so. I believe it is. It is. is. So past tense of learn. Learned. I think a strategy that not a lot of trainers do that I used to teach my trainers was to teach them to be planting the seeds and setting up for the re-sign well before they're even due for that. A very common mistake that I found in leading trainers for a very long time was most of them trained were great trainers they loved learning about nutrition they loved programming they loved working their clients out they hated selling so they waited till it was time to resign like the, like the last session uh, of yeah the, the last session to bring up this awkward conversation <laughs> and this was a challenge this is very very common with trainers and so one of the things that I would teach my trainers to make this easier on yourself is to be setting the close up mm -hmm. a day one. Mm -hmm. Let's say somebody just buys five sessions or 10 sessions. I'm already, not only am I coaching them on their body right now and talking about what they're going through in the workout, but I'm also talking about our future together. And I, and I do it in what we call an assumption close. I just assume mm -hmm. if you're training with me, because 80% of my clients train with me forever. That's That was my attitude, and I carried myself that way. That Because the way I looked at it is 80% of my people needed me forever because much of them, most of them had so, so much to work on, whether it be psychologically or physically or nutritionally, that I could provide value in those three areas pretty much for a lifetime for most of these people. So I had that attitude. So day one, I'm already talking about what we're going to be doing in weeks eight and weeks 12. You're always constantly communicating what you're going to be doing next with them. And you have a plan for them. And here's what it looks like. And you're painting that picture the entire time you're meeting with them. That's always been a go-to for me. And it just, it drives conversation. And then it, it gets real-time updates as far as what their struggles are and, and you know, how you can, how you can kind of help them with that process. And maybe we do a deeper dive in nutrition, you know, this next month and really like tackle these issues and you know whatever like you're just you're opening up that conversation yep. so it's constantly getting them to think ahead like oh wow okay so i'm going to work on that next and we're going to do this and then you don't even have to talk about like you said it's the assumption it's it's like they'll know me coming you they'll say well, well yeah, they'll I only, come, they'll, I've, do i sign now? many times i'd have people say like well i only have five sessions with you what am i supposed to do then well don't worry and they would do a takeaway close don't worry about it. When we get closer to the end of your sessions, we'll talk yep. about the different options that you have for continuing on with me. And then you just keep, go back to doing your job mm -hmm. really, really well, like and explaining to them the things that you're going to be doing. But having a plan as a trainer early on, you know, your job when you do a really good assessment, right? And this is, again, this is why Prime was created. You know, you have this great assessment tool that you use with your client to find all about their body and all the things that you need to do for them. And now you have a plan like, okay, this person should be working on these imbalances for X amount of time. And then this is what we're going to be doing nutritionally to help rebuild their metabolism for X amount of time. And then we're going to transition into more of their goal focused on for this amount of time. And you have a plan. So sit down as a trainer, really map out what you would do with this client if they already had a hundred sessions with you and what would that look like? Mm -hmm. And then you just start, as you're training them, you're talking as if they already bought the hundred mm -hmm. sessions. So that will uh, lead them to ask the buying question of, mm -hmm. well, I don't have any more sessions and, or I, you know, what do I do after these? Like, Oh, don't worry. We'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. These were all, I mean, there were different, different levels of learning that I had to go through to learn how to continue to retain clients. And we, what we're talking about now is kind of the early stages of learning how to talk about being with me later on, talk about the plan and the future early on in our working together. So people knew, you know, 10 sessions in, five sessions in, two sessions in, what it would look like later on as we were working together, figure out different goals, figure out different tasks, talk about those things and, and how we're going to continue working. Then later on, uh, I, I learned how to become 
uh, the the maven or the person that that person would come to when they didn't want to work out. That was a big learning uh, period for me later on. And what I mean by this, by the way, is early on in my career, if a client stayed with me for a year, that was a long time because I was a new trainer and a year seemed like forever. And a year is a long time to have a client Mm -hmm. compared to the average. Then later on, I'd have clients that would stay with me for two or three years, which is sounds like an eternity. Then later on, I'd have clients that stay with me for the same people, right? Who'd stay with me for 10 years or 12 years or longer. And there's different levels of learning that entire time. Mm-hmm. The second stage was learning how to be that person that they want to come to when they don't want to work out. Like a, a beginner trainer, a client would call them and say, my shoulder hurts. I'm really tired. Uh, my back hurts. I have, to ske- I have to reschedule this appointment. Well, if you get to the point where your client calls you and says, hey, you know, hey, Sal, listen, I know we're not scheduled to work out today, but my back really hurts. Can I come in so you can help me out? Mm-hmm. Now you've reached another level. So now, then when my client started calling me for that, that's when I reached the two year and three years of, of staying with clients. The next level from there was when I got to the point where I, w- where I could create an environment where my clients were working out for the sake of working out. It was no longer to work out for a goal. It was no longer because I need to lose. I mean, you train someone for 12 years. Like yeah. They're going to be trying to lose 30 pounds for the first six months to a year. After that, like, are they going to be still trying? Are they still going to be trying to get better shape? Are they still going to be trying better performance? Some of them will, but a lot of them at that point now are working out for the sake of working out. You they're working what? out because they enjoy the time. That took me a long time. I've, I felt very insecure about that because I always felt like I had to produce and I had to get them results and I always had to get them. And so... You know, it got to a certain point where a year would go by and I'm like, well, did I do my best, you know, with them for that year? Like I was very like hypercritical of the whole process of that. And then I just realized like they literally are working out and progressing, you know, at a gradual pace, but they're enjoying the entire process. And I have to be happy about that. Look, if you want someone to have long term success with fitness, then you have to get them to a point where they work out for the sake of the workout. Like, it's the way I work out. Like when I'm working out, yeah, there's goals sometimes and I want to get to a certain place. But most of the time I'm working out because I enjoy the actual workout itself. I'm doing it for the sake of doing it. And if you can get your clients to that point, then now they're they're going to be with you for a long time. Now, how do you do that? Well, you create a good relationship with exercise where, yes, initially it's about goals and there are targets and I can help you when you hurt. But it's also about enjoying the process. It's also about enjoying being here with me because let's be honest. When I'm a cool guy. Client, look, <laughs> yeah. if clients like, would be with, like me, out with me. If clients are going to be with me for you know between one to three days a week, so this this is how my client schedule look. I'd have clients that were with me on average between one to three days a week for an hour for twelve years. Like these people are sitting and talking with me and hanging out with me and working out with me or, or just spending more time with me than they are with most people in their lives. Right. If, especially if I worked out with them three days a week, how many people in their life do you think? Did they actually sit down and have good conversation and good undivided attention with for three hours out of their entire week? Well, look what we Not do very with, many. Look what we do with Mind Pump, right? We, we come out and we try and build trust and yeah. authority and education, right? right? And so we lead with that. And so we build your trust. You know, we win you over. Now let's get into the specifics. Well, yep, that's, yep. A, that's a good- Now we're going to get into lifestyle. Your first goal before selling them should be getting them to understand what they really need for themselves because 90% of the people that are going to sit down with you don't even realize what they really need. They're there because they're still driven by their insecurities of whatever whatever that may be, whether sure. they're too fat, they're too skinny, not enough muscle, too much muscle, whatever, not fast enough, too short. They have all these, these insecurities that's driving them to purchase training from you. You need to understand that. And my goal is first to get to the root cause of what drives you in, to, in here and then get you to understand what you actually need for long-term success before I, I sell you any more personal training. And so I think letting people know, I used to do this a lot too, when they tell me what their goal was, I would tell them like, oh, that's so easy. Your goal is easy. You know, any, I mean, getting you to lose 20 pounds or getting you to build 10 pounds of muscle. That's it's a simple it's, formula. It's math. I love math. That's really easy for me to do that. That's not what, but the problem is if you want to, if you want to be somebody who reaches their goal and then learns to maintain that for the rest of their life. So you feel good about where you're at forever. Well, that that takes a little bit more of a process. And part of that process is us getting to the bottom of what really drives you to be in shape or what causes you to fall out of shape. Mm. And that's what I'm really going to help you get to. Now, when I get somebody to understand that and understand that reaching the goal is actually really easy once we figure that piece out, 
then I've got yeah. you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Then then we can sell training. Yeah, early on, it's about getting to your goals. Uh, later on, it's about just enjoying it, just enjoying the process, enjoying the workout, enjoying the time that they're there with you. I'll tell you what, you find me any trainer who has clients who's with them for longer than three years, and I'll show you clients who just like to meet with that trainer and work out with them. That's what they're doing at that point. Like three years later, really, what goals are you after? Unless you constantly change your goals and you're one of those maniacs, which are pretty rare, for the most part, that person's there because they enjoy spending that time with the trainer. They enjoy that time. They enjoy the workout itself. And that's kind of the, the space you want to be in. And so, and think about it this way. Like, and I'll tell you what, I, I, have, I don't train anybody anymore. I do some coaching online, but I don't do any personal training. All the clients that I had who trained with me for eight, nine, 10, 12 years, every single one of them now, they haven't trained with me for at least two years. All of them, guess what they're still doing? They're still working out. Yeah, they have awesome. developed a relationship with the workout to where they enjoy the workout itself. And when you can get to that place, well, now it's fucking, now it's not a problem at all. So here's the, I mean, the other part of it is this, like, you got to be a likable person or at least, ha, you know, have, be <laughs> yeah. likable with your client. Like, <laughs> Practice that. For, maybe that's better advice. It is. Practice yeah. being likable first. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, look, I'll tell you what, you know what clients didn't stay <laughs> with be me a for? Great, Don't be, be boring a, and douchey. Right. You could be yeah. a great trainer yeah. all you want, but if nobody Here, fucking likes I'll you, I'll tell you what, luck. I can tell that's you, that's true though, I can man. tell that's you the trainers, true. I can always tell you the trainers who will not have clients for a long time. The ones that look at their phone constantly. Well, besides the obvious stuff, I can tell you the dedicated trainer who's not going to have clients that's going to stay with them for a long time. You know which one's going to be? The one that beats the crap out of the client every time they work out. Yeah. The one that's always focused on goals. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, come in here. It's fucking we're gonna make exhausted. You, we're going to make you sweat. We're going to make you work out so hard. And every client loves that trainer for about three to six Sometimes months. Sometimes the ones that are too star smart for their own good are, are have a hard yeah, time also yeah, yeah, because yeah. they're so concerned about being right instead of really helping people. Yep. And that does. And you got to understand that many, many people don't even know that they don't know yet. And so if you're if you're so concerned about being right and being smart that that you're when you talk to your clients you talk to them that way you're going to turn away fucking 80 90% Dude, of the people. Do you know how many and times that's very very common. I had many yep. PhDs, masters that worked for me that I had to fire and let go because they could never connect these dots yep. because mm -hmm. they were they were so proud of themselves for all the schooling and education that they had. They were so they and they cared more about that than they actually cared about the person sitting across from them yep. and that comes off. It comes off when you're that person who cares more about being right and being smart than you care about leading to these people to the yeah? If you can show that you really deeply care about that person, right. that's where the connection is. I mean, it's it's as simple as that, dude. Do you know how many times I've had because I've, I've, I've done this for so long, right? It's happened quite a few times where a client will call me and be like, "Hey, man, I didn't get good sleep last night, or I feel, you know, I'm really stressed out, or this is what's happening, and I, you know, I don't really want to feel like working out." And then I'd say, "Look, John, come in. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna take you through some stretches." We're going to do some myofascial release, um, and I might do some mobility work with you. Or sometimes a client would walk in, I'd look at them, and be like, you don't you don't want to be here. I'd be honest with them. Like, you don't want to be here right now. They'd be like, you know, I don't have the energy to work out. And I'll say, I'll tell you what. Why don't we do this? Let me take you through some light mobility work. I'm going to work on your shoulders a little bit, and then let's go for a walk outside for 30 minutes, and let's just do some stuff uh, outside. And they would love it. And sometimes we would just fucking walk. Sometimes, and you know what's funny? When I first do, started doing that, I would think to myself like, oh man, I feel bad. Like they're paying me to go with them on a walk. You know what I would get instead? They'd be like, you know what? Thank you so much. Like I got to do some activity. I appreciate you taking me out on a walk. I really wasn't feeling like a hard workout right now. Feeling kind of tired, stressed out. I really appreciate the fact that you had me walk. Because they're just happy that they got to do some activity, but they enjoyed it with you and whatever. And it was more appropriate. And then these people would just, they'd stay forever. And they'd continue forever after you're done training with them. And I think that's the key to being a real successful trainer for your clients. So check this out. A lot of people don't know that we're on Instagram and we have different information out on our Instagram If you want to see Sal's sexist memes, make sure you go check out Mind Pump oh. Sal. Mind Pump Sal. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can yeah. go to Mind Pump Adam or Mind Pump Justin. That is all of our pages. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic, 
Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.